Okay, we were going through uh, virtual reality and science. Um, you've probably heard of the anthropic principle. The anthropic principle is a, has come up as a, another one of these uh, paradoxes in physics that seems to have no explanation. And that is that when you look at this physical universe, our virtual reality, you see that it is very fine-tuned for our existence. That's why it's anthropic. It looks like the whole universe was just built for us. And they come to that conclusion because some of the physical constants they have, you know, the things that have to be just a certain way or this whole universe would just implode on itself because it wouldn't be stable. So for this virtual reality to be stable, you have to have this quantity to be exactly this number to eight decimal places. If you change that last eight decimal place, it'd all go to hell in a handbasket. It would disappear. We'd all die the next day. You see, it wouldn't work anymore. It would fall apart. And there's a whole set of these numbers and, and ideas and things that are like that. They're just fine-tuned such that this virtual reality just hangs together. In other words, the rule set is just able to create something that's stable. And that made people think, why is that? It's like it was built just for us because it's just the stuff that lets us survive here is this real picky picky stuff in the eighth decimal place and that being a big mystery uh, is solved easily obviously with a virtual reality when the system wanted to create this virtual reality as a entropy reduction trainer for us to grow up in it had to evolve the rule set I'm sure it made up a rule set and said, well, let's see how this one does. And probably after a million years or so, it self-destructed. Well, that's not quite right. Let's tweak it a little bit. And then they did it again, and they tweaked it, and they did it again, and then it blew back up again, and they did it again. And probably after a million iterations, they had a rule set that would create a virtual reality that's stable enough to last long enough to give the products of that evolution a chance to mature and grow and see what happens. If it didn't last long enough, then you know, we wouldn't be here. It has to be stable. Now we know that our universe is not stable forever. We know that one day, it's you know, second law of thermodynamics is one day there'll be nothing but you know, elementary particles and hydrogen atoms floating around. Everything will end up you know, with a very high entropy. The sun one day is going to explode, and when it does, this planet you know, turns into dust. You see, So we know that it's not really long, long, long-term stable, but you know, we have a few more billion years. <laughs> it's not like we have to worry about that yet, but eventually there won't be anything here. It'll all self-destruct. So you have to fine-tune it through trial and error until you get a set of rules that produce a workable simulation. So no doubt, this evolved. Everything evolves. Everything starts with an idea and it evolves. So that's why our universe seems to be fine-tuned for us because it was. It evolved that way until we got one that worked. So that's not a surprise. So the anthropic principle is not the big mystery. The next big mystery uh, floating around is the Fermi paradox. Have you heard of the Fermi paradox? Fermi paradox, Enrico Fermi, a well-known physicist, um, sitting around at lunch one day having a discussion with his co-workers and co-scientists, and the, the conversation went to ETs, and Fermi, being the brilliant guy that he was, said, well, where are they? Where are the ETs? And he said, he went through his logic that said, the universe is so many billions of years old. Our star and us, we're somewhere later. We're not at the beginning. We're somewhere, you know, like maybe, you know, I don't know. You know, there's been other universes, I mean, other parts of our universe that are billions of years older than we are. Given that, with all the trillions of stars and planets and things that are around that something would have evolved in that older part of the universe first 
and if it did it sort of like we did, then they could be billions of years more evolved than we are because they got a, you know, they got a three billion year head start on us or something. So he said, if that's the case and you do the math and you find out it's really a very strong uh, logical point of where are they? Because even if you can't go faster than the speed of light, you don't have, you know, the, you know, you can't get Scotty to, you know, go to warp five. You have to stick with sub light speeds. And they took very conservative things, like even at, you know, 0.1 the speed of light or 0.01 the speed of light. In those many billions of years, just going one planet at a time, at a time, at a time, you know, just slowly moving out, should have been all over the universe by now. So if that's the case, where are they? See, plenty of time to be here, plenty of time to evolve. Of course, using ourselves as a model about how long we've been here and how long it took us to evolve, but it's because we're in a little newer part of the universe. Uh, our whole evolution is on a you know, the later timeline. And that then, because it was such a strong argument that he had, yes, the probability that they should be all over the place, and we haven't seen them. Well, some people have seen them. But we haven't seen them. <laughs> then, you know, there was lots of answers to that. If you go up and Google Fermi Paradox, you'll find pages and pages of stuff, and a lot of deep thinkers have tried to solve that paradox. And there's dozens of solutions, but nobody really has solved it very well yet. Well, the Fermi paradox is easy to solve if you have a virtual reality. In a virtual reality, okay, we have this real big universe. From our viewpoint, of course, it's a virtual reality. With a virtual reality, it's only data streams that the uh, computer's giving us. Well, what kind of data stream does it have to send to us about some planet, you know, 50 light years away? Zero. So you think, well, it wouldn't have this whole universe out there with all this stuff in it and us just being the only one. Well, no, it wouldn't. But you don't need a whole universe with everything in it. All you do, all the computer does is compute what you need in your data stream, what I need in my data stream, and that's it. At nighttime, one bit, maybe two bits, for a light in the sky is all it needs to produce. The daytime, it doesn't have to produce that. An astronomer gets in a telescope and it has to produce just what that's in that field of vision. That astronomer turns his telescope off or looks someplace else, doesn't have to produce that. You see, so we don't have this big thing that would have to be produced and we're just this one tiny speck of it and that's very inefficient. It could just be us. And that would also make a good explanation. It goes along with that anthropic principle. It's kind of made for us. And if it's just us, then that's why ET hasn't shown up yet. Because all they are is dots of light in the sky until somebody looks. And then somebody's given the data of what they see by taking a random draw from a probability distribution. What would be out there if they looked right in that spot? Well, that's what they see. And they stop looking. It's not that it disappears. It was never there in the first place. It's a virtual reality, you see. So none of that out there, all of those billions of stars, trillions of stars, and all those planets, they don't really exist. The only thing that exists is what the computer sends to individuated units of consciousness in a data stream. It's the only thing. See, it's a virtual reality. So in a virtual reality, you can have Huge universes. And you don't calculate any of it except what some player is looking at. It's the only calculation you have. When there is no players in the world of Warcraft, nobody's logged on, that computer is doing nothing. It's not creating scenes and making the rivers flow and the trees grow and you know the, the bears walk around. You know, none of that's happening. It's not like that happens when nobody plays. You know, the bears have a picnic, right? When nobody's playing World of Warcraft. No, they just don't, you know, they never were there in the first place. They're virtual characters. They don't have to be rendered. So neither does this whole universe. The only thing that has to be rendered right now for all of you is just what you've seen, taking in. Nothing else. You see? 
So you take all the people on this planet, all the critters on this planet, all the rendering that needs to be done as far as reality goes in this whole universe is right there. That many data streams, seven and a half billion data streams. That's it. You look up into the sky with a big telescope, all right, we'll render that for as long as you're looking and then it's gone. Now you look up there again, you'll see the same thing because you brought it into this reality. History says it has to stay that way. You look right next to it, you'll see something that's compatible with that because there's a consistency rule. You see? And if you look again next year in the same spot, you'll see the same things because now that's part of our reality. But when you're not looking, it's not being rendered. And you'll find that out if you look at this no man's sky. It works the same way. It's got over a quintillion number of planets in it, which is probably about the size of our universe. And you can visit any one of them, and all of them will have its own ecology, its own critters, all of that. Because it's so big, even if tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people played it for the next hundred years, probably all of the planets would never be discovered. It's that big. And these guys developed this on a laptop. You see, that's all the computer power it takes because as soon as you're not looking, it disappears. They don't compute and store in memory anything. Everything's computed on the fly. You look here, they compute what's there, they send it to that player. On his screen, he gets that. He turns his head, that's gone. He looks back here again. They've taken the changes. Everything's run out of random numbers. You've got uh, certain fundamental object types. Random numbers will determine whether the critter has six legs or eight legs or two legs, whether it's tall or short, and you just do all this, and poof, everybody has unique critters. The makers that make this have no idea what the critters and fauna look like on these planets. They created it. But until you go there, they had to spend a lot of their, their time getting this ready for market just exploring what they made because they had no idea what would be out there. But once you've seen it once, you go back, it's exactly like that. It picks up, except evolution continues there. So when you go back a year later, everything's progressed one year Earth time. It jumps that delta T and there it is. There's migrations of the critters. There's, you know, evolution takes place on these planets. So you don't need much. It doesn't take that much computer power. We're not talking about something that has to track every particle in the universe. Because there are no particles in the universe. It only has to keep up with our data streams. That's it. So where are they? Well, one solution that nobody's ever put up on you on, uh, for this yet is that it's a virtual reality. Anthropic principle. Sounds like it's made for us. So the, the Fermi's paradox and the anthropic principle both kind of come together in terms of a virtual reality. That may be the solution. Well, we'll, we'll do questions later. Let's see. So brains, virtual brains. Uh, you might expect if you had, you know, since this is about our perception, that the people who study perception would come across some of these odd things that would kind of be contradictory to what we believe from our materialistic viewpoint. And indeed, they have. They see the problems too. Just like the scientists in the double slit, they see some contradictions of it. Well, you'd expect the people in perception to see that too. And they have. And I've got some lists up here of just a couple of them. Brain scans from a 2007 study in The Lancet. Now, The Lancet's a pretty reputable journal. This is not stuff that you pick up off the internet that somebody made up. This is real published science. Um, they had a, a Frenchman missing 90% of his brain and still functioning perfectly well. I don't think he was a brilliant guy, but he had an IQ of like 90. Had a job, had a wife, had kids, perfectly normal. 90% of his brain was not there. More dramatic than that, uh, you can see the, the words here, uh, so you can look these stuff up. Roger Lewin published an article in Science, again, not a, not a weak 
publication, that's pretty uh, strong, is your brain really necessary? And he reported a whole bunch of cases, lots of cases, not just one freak case, but there are a whole bunch of cases of people who have almost no brains at all physically and still function well. And one of the ones he talked about a lot was a, was a man in Sheffield University. And he was a graduate student, as I understand. He was doing a graduate degree in mathematics. Had an IQ, what does it say, of 126, which they measured. And he had something like 5% of his brain. That 5% was basically a little piece of brain stem coming up off the spinal cord and a thin layer, you know, centimeter thick or a few millimeters thick that just was a whole, the inside of his skull had this little thin layer of brain on it. He didn't have any cerebral, cerebral cortex, you know, the thinking, all this stuff, the, the part for sight, the part for, you know, for uh, coordination, hearing, all that. So none of that was there. Just a little film around the inside of the skull and a brain stem. 100, you know, 126 IQ, doing really well at his studies at math. There was a group of these that he found, and I just quote this out of, out of the article about it. It says, of that last group, which had less than 5% of normal brain tissue, half were profoundly retarded. The remaining half had IQs greater than 100. They were smarter than average, less than 5%. And I'm not sure how many was in that group, but it wasn't just this one guy. There was, you know, it was a group of people. I think it was like maybe 10 or 15 or something like that. It was a small number, but sizable enough that this isn't a one-off. It happens. Well, how do you explain that? Materialists, you know. Brain creates consciousness? I don't think so. That's why he entitled his article, Is Your Brain Really Necessary? It wasn't necessary for these folks. Now, the question would be, why is it that half of them were severely retarded and the other half were more than average intelligence? And I don't know that. I just ran into this information not that long ago. But thinking about it for a moment, it seems to me there are two probable reasons. I suspect that the ones who have the high IQs were ones that didn't discover they didn't have a brain until much, much later in life, when they already were successful university students. And the ones that profoundly retarded were the ones that we knew from birth or near birth or when they were very, very young that they were going to be tremendously retarded. Intent modifies future probability. Expectation modifies future probability, you see, because it changes your intent. So when the doctors tell you, oh, your child had, had this fluid, you know, what happens is the spinal fluid fills up the skull. There's no room, no room for the brain to develop. That's the, that's the process that happens. And when they find this in a young child or in a baby, then it's severe retardation when they find this in somebody that's working on their master's degree in math, it's a different story, you see. Well, of course, it's a virtual brain in a virtual body, right? The brain doesn't store anything. It doesn't remember anything. It doesn't analyze anything. It's just a virtual brain. It's no different than your virtual body. It's a bunch of ones and zeros sitting on a hard drive someplace. That's what physical stuff is. It's, it's the World of Warcraft map. It's the trees that grow in World of Warcraft and the rivers and the rocks there and the buildings. That's the same way your brain is. It's ones and zeros on a hard drive someplace. It's not something that has memory or makes decisions or does any of that stuff. It's just a virtual brain. What does the virtual brain do? Well, it sets the constraints on what the consciousness can do with his avatar. And it represents the rule set. Okay. So our evolution in this virtual reality has created a virtual, an avatar like us with certain capabilities and certain limitations. And it's our bodies that represent those limitations in terms of what the rule set can do. We can't jump 20 feet in the air. It's just not made that way. We're too heavy. 
Legs are too spindly. They don't have enough muscle to leap 20 feet in the air. Can't do it. Some other critters can leap six or seven times their height, you know, in the air, but we can't. That's the rule set. It's the way we evolved. So we can't do that. Well, we have this brain. Somebody hits us on the head with a pipe and causes brain damage. Well, maybe we limp. Maybe we can't remember. Maybe we, uh, you know, go into a comb or something because they've changed the constraints. Now you have a big groove, you know, there where your brain was, and it changes the constraints. When it changes the constraints according to the rule set, well, now the consciousness is limited in ways that it wasn't limited before. It's constrained. Now its avatar can't remember anything and can't walk straight. So it's got to play the game with an injured avatar. That's the way it works. Learn what it can learn from that set of choices as opposed to the other set of choices it would have had. It's still an educational game. And after all, it's just a game. You'll go get another avatar when that one wears out. So the idea that the brain creates consciousness is kind of a silly idea. When you have conscious people getting you know, degrees in advanced mathematics, they don't have a brain. But they're conscious. They walk, they talk, they get married, they have kids, they live a life, they do math. All you need is one example to disprove a rule. You know? So, the um, last one I have here is, is uh, Dr. Donald Hoffman, and uh, he actually works nearby in Irvine. And he's, uh, he's from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Computational Psychology, and what he studies is perception, artificial intelligence, evolutionary game theory, and the brain. So uh, there's a guy studying all the right things, right, with the right credentials. You know, he's into the computer side of psychology, and he got that computer uh, work in, uh, in MIT, a place that excels in that sort of thing. So we figure he's a pretty sharp guy. And he came to the conclusion from his studies of perception that this physical reality was very much like the GUI, the GUI, graphical user interface, on your desktop. That it's just a symbol or a metaphor for a process behind the curtain somewhere else. And his idea was that we needed this GUI, otherwise we couldn't operate the machine. You know, so it's like you can't operate your computer if you had to go and manually shuffle ones and zeros around. It just wouldn't work. You need a simpler interface that allows you to make decisions and express yourself at that level and then let the machine do its magic back behind the curtain so you don't see it. And he's done some mathematics to prove this. He's modeled it and shown that by actually interacting with what's there, it's very suboptimal. What you need to interact with is that GUI. You need to interact with that place that gives you choice and decision that you're capable of dealing with, that you have the ability to work with. Now, he does not mention the word virtual reality because he just hasn't gone there with it yet. But if you listen to his description of what reality is behind the curtain, He's talking about a virtual reality. That's just not his terminology. He hasn't uh, thought of that yet as a, as a bigger picture way of describing what he's doing. And he's in the process of making math models to uh, create this reality and the processes behind it. So he's contributing that way. So here's somebody else, a bright fellow, who looks at perception and the way we think and the way we interact with our world and comes to a conclusion, totally independent of everybody else, that it's all an illusion. It's all metaphor. What you see is not really what's there. It's only a, an interface. Well, if you're the consciousness working this, you could call your avatar, it's just an interface, right, to that game. Your avatar is your interface to that game. Okay, so those are some of the things that virtual reality, you know, if, if you start looking, at well, if this is a virtual reality, how could we tell? Well, I've given you a whole bunch of things that seem to say, eh, you look at the data and it kind of looks like this might be a virtual reality because it answers a whole lot of these otherwise unknown kind of questions. And a lot of people from different fields agree. 
I'm going to try to make this one shorter. In the double slit experiment, the observer is critical okay, to getting objective which way data. And you know what I mean by which way data? It's which slit did the particle go through. You get two slits and one particle heading toward them, and the particle is going to go through one of those two slits and end up on a screen back here. Okay? So if we can determine which slit, the which way data, then it'll end up in piles behind each slit. But if we can't determine it, it'll end up being spread over the screen in this nice little diffraction pattern. So all the particles will just arrange themselves in this neat little complex pattern just because that's what they do. Okay? That's the double slit experiment. Well, in order to know what slit it goes through, you need an observer. Somebody has to look, see, what slit did it go through? Okay? You need a person. Without that person, you get the fraction pattern. With that person looking, oh, it went through that slit, well, then it ends up hitting the screen right behind that slit. You see, whether the person is looking at it or not makes all the difference in the world. Well, scientists have really scratched their heads over that for almost 100 years, and they say, what's the person have to do it? What does the observer have to do with physics? When did physics become something that works this way if you look and that way if you don't? Well, now that I've explained virtual reality, the observer is there because reality only exists in the mind of the observer. You're getting the data stream. If there's, no, if there's no observer in the link, there's nothing being rendered in this reality. See? So the observer is critical to that experiment. If there's nobody there to observe, then we have one pattern. And if there is somebody there to observe, you force the system to a different pattern because now it has to provide data to somebody. If it has to provide data to somebody, then that's different. That's new. You're adding new things. So that's why you have this observer issue, the measurement problem it's called in physics because it takes a human, it takes a consciousness to measure something. Things don't measure themselves. So the measurement problem is the human in the loop which has to do with our reality is created by data streams, the individuals who then interpret that data as this reality. All right. Uh, one other example. Talk about as an example, let's say, a, a walkie-talkie. Okay, this will also cover action at a distance. If I have a walkie-talkie or a CB radio or something like that, I talk here and somebody else hears it a mile away. And they talk and then I hear it. And, of course, I say there are no thing, such things as fields. Well, there aren't fields. It's just the way our rule set's made. If you do certain things here, that'll cause certain things to happen you know, someplace else. It's the nature of our rule set that's like that. It doesn't require a field. But let's, let's think about this double slit experiment and, and uncertainty for a minute. The reason the double slit experiment works the way it does is because there's so much uncertainty about where those particles are. We don't know where they are, where they are. And because of that uncertainty, there's multiple things that can happen. And when you have multiple things that can happen and you take that random draw out of the probability distribution, there's multiple things. Sometimes you get it this way. Sometimes you get it the other way. And the only reason you're making that measurement is because somebody called for the data. A human's in the loop calling for the data. That's why you draw from that random distribution. But the same thing happens in the macro world, too. So when I talk on a, on a CB radio, you know, it always has static in it, right? It's always got the buzzes and the pops and the cracks and that kind of thing. All right? Where does that static come from? Well, a materialist would say that there's coming from the cars on the highway. It's coming from light fixtures. It's coming from machines. Anything electrical that's running or doing anything, uh, lightning, whatever, creates these things. It's just background noise, right? There's lots of sources. When you're listening to that CB radio and you hear that static, if nobody is actually measuring the sources of the noise you hear on that radio, and some other radio a mile away will hear a whole different set of static, if nobody's measured those sources, they're unknown. They're all uncertain. Why would the larger conscious system go about 
surveying all the possible electrical activity within 20 miles because that's the range of the set and calculating all of that noise so that you can just hear squeal, you know, pop, that kind of thing, right? It'd just kind of be a waste of time, wouldn't it? What it does is it looks at that area and says, well, you know, it could be any number of things. Just draw from the random number. All right, here's the static for today. Here's the, just for this radio being turned on. It's entirely random draw of the possibilities. Nobody's measured it. The system doesn't compute it. It's just something comes out that's likely to come out. And the reason it's likely, because there's probably a dozen things that are possible, but they're all have some likely, wouldn't be there. You know, the, the things that are really strange, like maybe cosmic radiation or something, that's maybe a real low probability, but that's the way it is. So the system doesn't have to keep updating that. It says, this is good enough. And that's what you're hearing on that radio. You're not hearing anything that has anything to do with any of those possible sources around there, you're hearing a probabilistic result because you've not forced the system to do the measurement. Now, if you have a whole team of scientists and they're all running around taking measurements of what the electrical activity is in that area and then tracking it with directional tracking and finding out where it comes from, now the system has to do it from all the sources that are in your neighborhood. But if you don't track it down and it's unknown, all it has to do is go pop on your thing on your receiver, and that's what you hear. It doesn't compute anything. It doesn't have to compute. It doesn't just compute because it loves accuracy. It's running a virtual reality here, and it computes to give you what you need in your reality to make your reality smooth and functional. I couldn't say no static because that just wouldn't be realistic, right? So things like that happen in the macro world, but see, we never notice. Because the reason it happens that way is that nobody's measuring. If somebody were to measure, then you'd only hear exactly what all those sources produced. The system would have to do more work. If nobody's measuring, it doesn't have to. So we see we still have this observer thing going on in the macro world. Depending on the observer and the amount of uncertainty, there's more or less choices. And the system isn't going to compute anything that isn't necessary to compute to satisfy the needs of that request, that virtual reality request. And it's not going to compute anything past the amount of accuracy or resolution it needs to compute either. So in our daily life, much of what we take for granted and believe in a material cause is just probabilistic. We get that because it's just probable. That's okay. We wouldn't notice the difference as long as we can't say, oh, that's fake static. That couldn't be coming from here. If you could notice that, then it wouldn't be able to give you that. It's only because you can't notice it that it doesn't have to compute it. So I'm, I just give you as example, is in our daily life, there's lots of things going on that we believe in our little hearts have material causes that are just probabilistic. So um, cell phone is another example. I'll try to do this one quickly. If you have a cell phone, you dial up a number. Somebody say, let's say it's in South Africa, and you dial up their number, and it goes from your phone to a cell tower to some other kind of larger cell tower that communicates to a satellite, that communicates to another satellite to another satellite to another satellite, which downloads it down to a cell tower in South Africa, which then moves it through the cell system to a cell close to the person holding the phone that you're calling. Well, there's a lot of steps. There's a lot of technology in there. What does the larger conscious system have to, have to compute? Well, the number. That number is associated with somebody in South Africa. So only one person has that number in the world. They're all unique. That's why you can call an individual. It can look at the system, all those cell towers, all those satellites, all that electronics, all through that system. And there's a certain probability that that stuff will all be working. And there's a certain probability that some of it will fail. And if it hadn't had maintenance for a long time or it's old, the probability of failing goes up and so on. Okay? So what it does is it can group all of that probability up into one probability function. So basically it has a random draw. Is there a problem in this transmission? No, not likely. It's a low probability, but could be. Just probability. Well then, 
let's wait for the appropriate amount of delay that all that would take, and then let's voice the message or write the text to the phone in South Africa. You see, it doesn't have to compute all that stuff. It doesn't need to go through all the steps to get it there. All it needs to do is see what you're doing, you have an action, and that creates a reaction in South Africa. It just does both ends. The middle is a, just probability. And every once in a while, it draws out of that probability distribution. Oh, no, something's broken. Something didn't work right. You know, cell tower's down, or phone didn't work, or something. And then, of course, it doesn't go through. There's a problem. Somebody has to go out and fix it. So all of these electronics and all of the mechanical things, all the double slit experiments, all have their own logic, how they work. This does this to that, and that does that to something else, and you have this long chain of logic. And in all that logic, there's uncertainty, things that could happen. And that's just a calculation. So the system doesn't have to compute everything. So it's just like it doesn't have to compute all the stars in the universe. Nobody's looking at it. It doesn't have to compute all that stuff. All it needs is the logic. We built the system. When we build that, that communication system, we build it because of the logic. We knew how to, to do it and the pieces that represent that logic. All the system has to compute is the event, the action and reaction. Remember, all we see is you know, what happens to us. We don't see behind the curtain. So in many cases, the conscious system doesn't have to compute all that detail. It's not into computing all the little electrons flowing through the wires all over the planet in order to make things happen. It just makes things happen. You call here, it goes there. But see, that's hard to tell, because if you measure it, if you want to go up there and plug you know, your earpiece into that satellite, sure enough, you'll hear your call going by, and there it'll be. If you don't measure it, no need to do any of that. So now you see we live in a pretty squirrely reality, right? It's not like you thought all buttoned down and, and great process. Lots of things are the same as a double slit experiment. When there's lots of uncertainty and nobody's looking, nobody's measuring, the system isn't going to compute it. It's just going to give you a probabilistic answer. So that makes your reality kind of different than what you thought it was. It's not so buttoned down. All right, we're going to do a quick uh, action at a distance. I think we've already talked about this. Uh, I don't know that I really have to say much about it. The actual cause is the, is the, is the um, rule set. We don't really have action at a distance. Whether it's gravitation or whether it's charges in electric fields, there's not some magic force field. I mean, look at this force field. Look at this electric field. How much does it weigh? How much volume does it take up? What does it smell like? What does it feel like? You know, I mean, there's, there's, it's, it's that same as the pink elephant, I said, that created reality that flies around at night that nobody can see. You see, it's an invisible, non-falsifiable concept. But the rule set says that these things happen, that these things are related. It's part of the rule set, so they are. So action at a distance doesn't really happen. Fields, even morphic fields, electric fields, magnetic fields, gravitational fields, force fields, all these fields, the only kind of fields that exist here are the kind you grow potatoes in you know, and raise cattle on. The rest of these fields are just mathematical constructs that really have nothing to do with fundamental reality. They're just a way of computing what's going to happen someplace else. Okay? A wave equation does not logically imply a physical process. We just believe that it does because we need to believe that. It makes us feel good. Okay, um, yeah, we, as if there was a physical wave, as if there were all these towers, as if there were satellites, as if all that stuff existed. That's what we get. The as if is what we actually see, not the stuff. But that can only happen. We can only get that as if because all that stuff, the logic of it, has been put together by us. We've created that system. 
and if we measure it, we can measure exactly what happens in all the various pieces of it. Um, hmm. This I'd share with you. John Archibald Wheeler, which was one of the very first scientists to realize that everything was information. Now, he didn't necessarily use the words virtual reality. He just came to the conclusion that everything is information. I was, uh, I was uh, interested and kind of amused by a statement he made when he was asked about his long career. Very eminent physicist, Wheeler. He was, he was with those guys over in Copenhagen, you know, when they were all sitting around trying to figure out what quantum mechanics was. So he died in 2000 and something, 2006 maybe, or something like that, as an old, old man. But he was a contemporary with Einstein and Bohr and, and the rest of them. He was the young kid. He was the young scientist that was hanging out with the, with the old guys that, that made history. But he had a very uh, stellar career, and he coined the phrase, it from bit. It being the universe, bit being information. And uh, anyway, he was asked about his career, and here's what he said. This is not an exact quote, but it's real close. He said, at first, everything was physical. But eventually, that didn't work anymore. Then, everything was fields. Eventually, that didn't work anymore either. Now, he says, everything is particles. And that still doesn't work. So, he says, I finally come to the conclusion that everything is information. And this was said 40 years ago, 30 or 40 years ago. So, that uh, I thought was, was a, a very good summary of physics over the last century. So, okay, so the reason we have action at a distance is because we want to believe that there's a physical cause. All right, now we're going to move on to what we're here to talk about. Yeah, the double slit experiment tells us clearly that particles are not physical because they don't act physical. When particles just distribute themselves in a nice pattern, that doesn't go along with being physical particles. But they're also not probability waves. That's just another made up description. It's not this little probability wave that travels around and the probability wave goes through both the slits because probability can go through slits. And people use that kind of language because they don't have any language or any way to actually describe what's going on. So they make up metaphors that sound sort of plausible if you don't take them too seriously. There is no wave function that moves through slits. Okay, that's not how it works, and I'll show you that. All particles are virtual because reality is virtual. After the double slit, quantum mechanics got started and we thought that there was a special science for little things. That when things get very small, they get weird and unpredictable because we can't see them anymore and we just don't know. So quantum mechanics became weird science that was non-intuitive. Okay. But it's small was not the issue. They missed that. It wasn't that they were small that made them unique. It was that they were uncertain. It was the uncertainty in their whereabouts and the uncertainty in their parameters that was the key. The fact that they were small was really irrelevant. Small was just the reason they were uncertain. You don't know where those little things are because there's no way to sense them and track them. So that created uncertainty. But the smallness wasn't the issue. So they just got that wrong. The same thing works in any place where there's a lot of uncertainty. A lot of uncertainty means a lot of possibilities. So again, the astrophysicist, he looks out in the universe, there's a hundred things that could be out there, maybe 10,000, because there's lots of different stuff out there. One of them gets drawn out, that's what he sees. Why? Because that's uncertain. You go under the oceans where things are uncertain, and you don't know it's down five miles under the water, because we hardly ever go there, and when you do, it's real dark, and you can't travel around very easily, and it's a tough environment to be in. So there's probabilities of the kind of things that could be in there, and random draw the possibilities, there. That's what you see. That's what you get. So it's uncertainty that's the key, not smallness. There isn't a special physics for things that are small. 
there is a big uh, impact about things that are uncertain. Because when things are uncertain, they allow a lot more possibilities. And when you have a lot more possibilities, you can come out with some really strange things out of that curve if you happen to pick the, the one in 10,000 thing that had a little tiny probability that just might come out. Typically, you're going to get something that's more likely, but you can get things that are very different. Yeah, you hear, you hear uh, scientists often saying things like, the particle went through both slits, or the probability wave goes through both slits and interferes with itself. And you'll hear them say these things, but they don't really believe it. They're just saying that because they don't know what else to say. They don't really believe that. At least not the ones that really understand the physics that they're talking about don't really believe that. These things are just metaphors. Um, but you'll hear physicists saying them all the time. Now, they're all fiction. They're all metaphors. It's simply a way of speaking that maintains an illusion of materialism. To say the particle somehow goes through both slits or appears to go through both slits. That keeps you kind of feeling like a card-carrying materialist and still, realize, and still talk about something that completely is contradictory to materialism. All right. This is just a little bit of a logic problem. I guess if you can read that, I can just don't have to really go over that. If you claim that, you're, uh, that our physical reality is based on the interaction of physical particles, well, that sounds logical, doesn't it? Physical reality, physical particles, but experimentally proven that it's incorrect. Okay, still the standard belief. Claiming that a physical reality is based on a collection of non-physical or virtual particles, that's illogical and incorrect. Claiming that our reality is virtual reality based upon a rule set that uh, defines the collective interaction of virtual particles is logical. Virtual particles building up virtual reality sounds like that might work. And it's correct. How could it be any other way? What kind of reality can you build up with virtual particles? Virtual reality. You're not going to start with virtual particles and end up with a physical reality. Well, our scientists today have come to the point that they're calling small particles virtual particles. So that's in the literature. They're all virtual particles. But somehow these virtual particles create a physical reality, a material reality. That's just not logical. You don't take virtual blocks and build up a structure that somehow magically turns into a physical structure just because it's gotten bigger and it's not small anymore. Smallness isn't the issue. All right, here's what I mean about a random draw from the probability distribution. This is a probability distribution. And it's kind of a lumpy one. You know, it's, it's not symmetric, doesn't have to be, mostly they're not. The letters A to Z express a potential, potential result. So here's A through Z, right? There's, um, what, 26 letters in the alphabet, so there's 26 different possibilities there. 26 different things could happen to answer this question, okay? Now that's the probability distribution, and the way you take a random draw from it isn't that you just randomly pick from A to Z. Think of it this way. The easiest way to think of it is let each one of these letters that's in a stack, like here I have a stack of K's, and I happen to have 25 K's in that stack. Okay? So I'm going to have a box, like in a raffle, and I'm going to put K on 25 pieces of paper. I'm going to throw those 25 pieces of paper with a K in it into the box. I'm going to do that with all these other ones. Okay, here with S. Here with S, I have 11. I'm going to put 11 pieces of paper with an S on it, throw it in the same box. I'm going to do that with all of these. Okay, now that box represents this probability distribution. Now I'm going to reach in and randomly draw one piece of paper out. That's my random draw from a probability distribution. You see, that's what we're talking about. It doesn't mean randomly pick A through Z. It means a draw from the probability distribution and you have a higher probability of getting, you know, like I, J, K, L, and M, right? 
because that's most of the pieces of paper, and there's got one of those letters on it. So that's what's most likely that you're going to get. But you could just get a Z. You're not going to get an E. That's zero. There weren't any of those in there. You might get an F. You might get an A. You know, you could get any of those things. But most likely, you're going to get something under the fat part of the curve. That's the way it goes. So your random draw from the probability distribution typically end up with what's expected, you know, with the thing that's most likely. Occasionally, it can end up with something that's totally off the wall, but still possible. That's what I mean. I'm just defining what I mean by uh, a random draw. So the probability of getting a K, since there are 25 of these, and since there's a total of 163 letters in this distribution, in other words, the 1 plus the 2 plus the 2 plus the 3, you know, plus the 12 and the 17 and the 20. If you add all those up, there's 163 letters in the box. So if 25 of them are Ks, then I got 25 divided by 163 is the probability I'm going to get a K. So that's just the way it, that's the way it works. All right. We'll go on. I just wanted you to see that. Okay, now this is just, uh, this is not one of the experiments. This is just kind of leading up to them so you get the idea of what my symbols mean and how I've laid things out and that kind of thing. So if you look at that picture, this is a standard double slit experiment where you have the which way information. So you end up with what we call a, a two bar pattern. This is the electrons just go through the slit and hit on the screen right behind the slit. They don't do anything particularly unusual. This is what was expected. No surprises. Two bar pattern acts like material particles are supposed to act. Um, so here are, here are detectors, one and two. Here are recording devices that record what's detected, R1 and R2. Here's a screen. That's a result screen. And there's an R3 that collects there. So you're going to see the same pattern in all kinds of things. So it just kind of gets you used to that idea. This is some kind of particle generator that spits out particles one at a time, or more if you like, but it does that. This represents a binary distribution. And here, what you have is a, is a uh, statistical representation of this, just like we could represent the cell phone network with probability. We can represent this with probability, too, because nobody's measuring that. They've put it together. The logic is there, just like the cell phone system. But nobody's doing a measurement of what's going on inside of that thing. It just does its thing, right? So we don't really need to worry about that if we're the larger conscious system. We just need to know what the logic says about it. When it gets here, in this case, since we're measuring what the detectors say and, and, and remembering them in this R1 and R2, the system takes a random draw from a binary distribution. Well, that's a binary distribution. All the probabilities are zero except for two. So that means it's a box, and the box has an equal number of ones and equal number of twos in it. And you're going to shake the box up, and you reach out, you're going to get a one or two, and it's just a random draw from a binary distribution. So it does a random draw, which tells it a lot of things. It tells it what slit is it going to go through, it tells it where to write. It's going to write something in R1 if it goes through slit 1. It's going to write something in R2 if it goes through that. Now, does it really have to worry about these slits and calculate them? No, nobody's measuring anything at the slit, really. What's measuring here is R1 and R2. So what it does is it takes a random draw, looks at the logic of the situation, and decides what it's going to write in which one of these. So if it dra draws one, it's going to have to write something in R1 after the appropriate amount of time. And when it gets here to the screen, it has to know where to put the particle, because here's another device that's measuring. So it's only the measuring devices that are important to the larger conscious system, because that's where something's going into somebody's data stream. When the scientist comes up and looks what's on that measuring device, he's got to have an answer. So the system really doesn't care about anything except those three measuring devices. The rest of it is all just logic. So it uh, makes the random draw say it went through one. It knows that in a certain number of uh, seconds, it's going to have to write something in one. 
that a pulse got there, and in a certain number of seconds, it's going to have to stick over here in, in one, a particle, somewhere behind that slit. Now, it doesn't matter where in this y direction that it puts it. That's irrelevant. It's just a big hole. It's just going to put it somewhere, a random draw on y. So that's it. This whole experiment can be done basically with that random draw. One random draw from a binary distribution experiment's over. The system knows what to write here, what to write here, what to write here, and that's the only thing that a consciousness will see. Everything else is irrelevant. Okay, now we're going to get into that just a, a little bit more. Okay, here's, here's one now doing uh, the classical uh, experiments you get with a diffraction pattern. You notice here, this is off. D1 is off. D2 is off, and it doesn't matter whether these are off or on because they're not going to get any signal, right? So they're not going to get anything except noise. So that's the only difference here is we're not collecting the which way data. Which way did the particle go through the slit? Which slit did it go through? Well, when that happens, the particles here just happen to align themselves in this nice little pattern. Each one of these patterns is a bar because the slit is a hole that's vertical, so it gets a bar. They just go through, and uh, again, the y up and down dimension is, is random. It doesn't make any difference. So as the particles go through here now, they spread out into these various bars. And these are just a bunch of little dots, and every dot is a particle that came through. And you notice there's more, this is darker, there's more dots in here. It's more dense with dots, and then here it's a little less, and a little less, and a little less. They get lighter and lighter as you go out. But sometimes a particle will go uh, through the little ends up over here and sometimes over here. And it's just random. So you'll see this one come in and that one come in and that one come in and that one come in. And if you watch these come in one at a time, they just randomly hit the screen and you don't know what they're doing until you get enough of them that you begin to see these bars show up on your screen. And the only difference between that and the first experiment where they lined up in two nice little columns behind each slit is that we're no longer looking at the which way data. There's no observer. Okay, now why would the larger consciousness system do this? What's its point? You know, why would it decide that this was something it had to do? Well, the reason is, is down here. A hundred years before the double slit was done, we had scientists working with light as a wave. Okay, they worked with light as a wave, and this is what they found down here. If they say, here's this light, it's called a plane wave, which means the, all the wave fronts are all in phase. It's an in-phase light. And the, the light wave gets here, where these bars are. And when it does, some of it pops through that slit. Some of that light will pop through that slit. And it's like signing a flashlight at it from a long distance off or something. And uh, when that happens, this is now becomes like a little source, like a little source of light coming through that hole. It's like looking at a hole with a light behind it, and you see this little point of light. And this is another source. And what happens is that the light comes from this source, now light's a wave, and it comes through this source and it comes up here. This source is a little longer. This line, D2, is a little longer than D1. And when the difference in that length between D1 and D2 is a whole wavelength, you get this sort of a pattern. See, it's like this. The waves are just one whole wavelength different. They line up. They're perfectly in sync with each other. Dips dip at the same time, humps hump at the same time, and you have what's called superposition, and you end up with a bright spot. So here in the middle we have a bright spot because it's equal distance. D1 and D2, there'd be D1 and there'd be D2, are exactly the same length. So there's no difference between them. They're all going to add up together and make a spot of light. In these areas, that's where the difference between the two paths are some odd integer of half wavelengths. So now you have a wavelength, and this one is just one half wavelength apart, and that's like this pattern or this pattern. So this one dips right where that one humps, and this one humps right where that one dips. They cancel each other out. You get nothing. So you end up with this thing that was called a diffraction pattern, and this is called the diffraction of light. And it was a wave phenomenon well known for 100 years before we ever got to a double slit experiment. 
So this is the thing that it looks like when you're actually measuring it. This thing with the bars, that's kind of a, a physicist's dream. That's, that's a good way to represent it in a cartoon, but actually it's a little messier than that. Some of these particles are kind of messed all around and the whole thing looks a little cloudy, but these stripes are real, real obvious. But it's not quite as neat as what I've shown here, that the pattern is sort of like that, which means that this is a high peak. That means this has a lot of spots in it. Okay, and this is a small peak. That's why this doesn't have so many spots in it. That's how you translate between this and that. Okay, this is, uh, this is where they end up on a screen, and this would represent how many end up here, not so many. A little more end up here, most of them end up here, and so on. Okay, now they, they compute this just by looking at the distance between the slits, the distance between the slits and the screen, and do a little algebra, a little trigonometry, and they can say where are they in phase, here, 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 and here, and where are they out of phase is where there is no light diffraction pattern. Okay, well we knew that. Now Einstein comes along and, and ruins the whole thing by telling people that light exists as a little chunk of momenta. That's a particle by definition. Light's a particle, not a wave. Well, most people said nonsense. We know light's a wave because we've been doing diffraction experiments for years. Well, they decided to test that, and one of the ways they tested this light particle thing was in this double slit experiment. This is where everything got weird for the physicists. So they found a way to get a light particle, and now we use lasers. They didn't have lasers then. They had to be more clever. But uh, we now have lasers because that's all coherent light. And we can get good enough technology, we can turn those lasers down to they're only going to emit one photon at a time, one particle. That's it. Well, when they do that, they come through here with one particle. Well, all the physicists who thought Einstein was mistaken, because Newton had actually done the same thing 100 years earlier. He said light was corpuscular too. And it came back up again then with Einstein doing the photoelectric effect. But everyone thought, of course, that the one it would either go through this slit for that slit, and it would end up right behind the slit. That's where it would hit the screen. And instead, they got a diffraction pattern. That's what started the whole weird physics movement called quantum mechanics. There was no reason why those particles should go through those slits and spread themselves out, laying in these strips and avoiding the places in between. But they did. The reason they did is that we have a boundary problem here. We've got history that says light's a wave. And this is what happens when it goes through two slits. And now if you send these one at a time as a particle, and you want your reality to be consistent, you give it this as a probability distribution. That looks just like this. You give it as a probability distribution because that will make it consistent with, remember we said that was one of the constraints on the larger consciousness system. It has to do things that are consistent with the past. So we've got a boundary issue here where wave meets particle somewhere in the middle and you can't have it doing something differently. Because uh, otherwise you'd have a physics that said, oh, when a bunch of particles get together, they change character and, and become waves, you know, well that doesn't make any sense at all. You know, it almost sounds like the particles are all, you know, in, in cohorts with each other, you know, it's a conspiracy to upset physicists. And that's not it. What it is is a boundary value problem. The system had to say that this probability, these particles are just virtual particles. The system has to say, what, am I, what kind of distribution am I going to draw out of to determine where these things hit. Before it was that binary distribution. But now there's nobody to tell me for sure that it went through that slit or the other slit. How can I tell it to land here or land there? There's no information. So, okay, it's a virtual particle. I'm a virtual reality. It's a virtual particle. 
what sort of probability distribution? Well, I have to use this probability distribution of the old diffraction pattern because that matches. Now we have a consistent reality. So it's because of this match at the boundary between particle and wave that the larger conscious system decided that's how it would sum the probabilities. And it would sum them just like this with a little trig formula that has to do with distances and separation of slits. Otherwise, why would the conscious system come up with the, well, we can combine the probabilities, you know, with the, with the sine function and the distance between slits. Well, that doesn't have anything to do with probability. So it chose to do it the same way that the wave did it, so it would get the same answer and have consistency. That's kind of all it's about. Now these detectors, by the way, they don't have any memory. They just are a detector. Here's the memory. Okay. And you'll find later that they come in two kinds. They come in a detector that just detects and sends a, par and sends a pulse. You know, let's say it just sends some kind of voltage pulse. And that's all it does. And this one just does the same thing. So you have just two voltage pulses that are identical to go out every time a particle goes through their slit. Or these detectors can come in a, in a flavor, come in a mode where they actually have identity information. They not only send out a pulse, but they say, this is a pulse from slit one. So you can think of it like if that's a digital uh, back end on that detector, it, has, uh, it, it can send a header information. This is a slit one pulse, and that's a slit two pulse. So we'll see, we'll, we'll have detectors of both types here later. So I just wanted to show you why the system would decide it would have to combine probabilities in terms of sine functions and slit distances and that sort of thing when it could have picked any way in the world to combine probabilities. It was faced with a consistency problem. All right, now, if I, if I send a whole lot of particles through that last experiment we just saw. If I sent a whole lot of particles through there, and I said we'd get this diffraction pattern, well, this would be the probability distribution of that. Okay, and I have, what, 1,608 1, of those particles went through there. So I have 1,608 points on the screen, and all the points that these are x values down here. Of course, you can't see that. But this, this starts down here at x1, x2, x3, x4, you know, x sub something, big number, all the way up there. So I have these x values across. And every time one of them hits in that, I stick them under this bar graph, right? And I produce this pattern. Okay. Now, when I want to know where it went in the y direction, it's this kind of pattern. It's a random draw. Here I have the y's, the y values up and down, and I have all these y values. But I have the same number of pieces of paper with each one of those y values in the box, because they all have equal probability. So if there's 10 of them, then I get 10 of every value with that number on that y value, and I shake it up and I take it, then I have an equal probability of getting any one of them. Okay, so that a, becomes randomized when you have probability distribution like that. Okay, so that's how we put an X and a Y. The system takes a draw from a distribution and takes a draw for the X, takes a draw from a random distribution like this for a Y, and that's where it sticks the point on the screen every time a point comes. Okay, so that's all there is about that. These are some other very useful distributions that I'm going to talk about. I want you to, to know we already looked at a binary over here. And here's x1 and x2 for, that, for the slit. And in that picture we had back before, that happened to be when we counted all those x's over. This happened to be x17. And this happened to be x26 as I counted over. So that's what these are. What this means is that it's it's zero everywhere else. So and I've got a box, and I've got an equal number of, of uh, pieces of paper in there that have this X17 on it, and another uh, same number of pieces of paper that have this X26 on it. I put them all and mix them up. I'm just going to get one or the other. Random draw from binary distribution. 
Okay. This is called a single value probability distribution. Now this is kind of a mathematical sleight of hand in the sense that you don't really need a single value means it's it's just that. It's got a prob it's only got one item in the probability distribution. All right, what's the probability, you know, that the door's going to be there like I told you. Well, it's a one. You know. Well, that's the way this is. When there's only one item in the distribution, here's an X17, then you've got a box that has n number of X17s in it. When you reach in and pull one out, it's going to be X17 because that's all that's in the box. Okay, so it doesn't sound like it's worth doing, but it's consistency. All you guys out there who are math-like understand we need this kind of consistency. We can't speak about these things. Anyway, here's a this one, and I called it a, a single value distribution one, a single value distribution two. So what we're going to find is that when they put the, the, the points, sometimes they draw from a single value, and they're going to get just the x value that's right behind slit one. Sometimes they'll get the x value that's right behind slit two, if that's the way the particles are going. And they get those out of these distributions. Sometimes, if they're saying what slit it goes through, they're going to draw from a binary distribution. And we're going to use these in a lot of different uh, places. Now, in physics, this thing that's uh, just that one point, they call that a delta function. At least they used to when I was in school 40 years ago. So it's a math kind of thing for selecting out a single, a single value. Um, right. Now let's go on going through these a lot quicker. This is, I'm going to tell you how this thing works. If you've ever wondered about this double slit experiment, most people that wonder, that see it, they say, all right, you fire the, the particle and it goes through one slit or the other. Why don't it ever hit in the middle? You know, what happens to the ones that don't make it through the slit? How do you know it's going through one slit or the other? Do you aim it at the slit? And if you aim it at the slit, how do you not know that it's going to go through the slit you're aiming at, right? Why does it go through one or the other? How does this work? It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to people, so I'm going to go through a little thing about how that works. This is just the end of the particle generator. Okay? And this is the two slits. You can see one slit here, one slit here. They're numbered X1, X2. Well, they turn the, the gain up on this particle generator, to it's actually a beam of light. Billions of particles coming out, right? And they shine this thing on it, and they, set, they use lenses and other kinds of things to make the beam of light be just slightly bigger than the slits. And they make it such that it's equal, pro, you know, it's equal density of light. It's equally bright everywhere inside of this dashed red line. And then it kind of fuzzes out as you go past it. It's not quite as bright out there. But everything inside this dashed line, it's equal intensity. Same amount of light hits every spot there. All right. Now, uh, there's a certain probability that if a particle comes out of here, that it'll actually, this represents that dotted line. That's X1 and X2, which now is, is not the slits, but it's these dotted lines. X1 is this dotted line. X2 is that dotted line. That was very clever of me to use X1 and X2 for two different things so I could confuse you. But anyway, you can keep that separate. This is just the box, right? The red dotted line box. And it's about a, let's say, 0 0.8, 80% of the particles come out of here are going to be inside the box. And 20% are going to fall outside the box. Okay, so this is just optics so far. It's, it's easy to understand. All right, next. Now, we're going to turn, well, we don't even have to turn it down yet. Now, we put our double slit up and put a screen there, right? And because we're not looking at which way data, we're going to get this diffraction pattern. Okay, that's what we're going to get. And what happens is that, you know, here's the, di here's the distribution that it draws from to get that pattern. So when the system says, okay, and exactly so many nanoseconds, I'm going to have to put a particle on that screen because there's something come out of that, this, something come out of this, so so many nanoseconds later, I'm going to have to put it on there. Where am I going to put it? Goes down here, takes a random draw out of this distribution, 
comes over here, takes a random draw out of this distribution. This one will give you some x value where it lands. Could be out here on this corner or down on this one. It gives you some y value, which are all the same. It's random. And that's where it puts the particle. Okay, That's what's going on. So each particle location on the result screen has a specific x value somewhere on the screen and a random y value somewhere between y1 and y2. Okay. Now, we're going to talk about the particle generator. In this particle generator, you have two things going on here. One is up here in this corner, upper left. That's a distribution for the time between particles coming out. So you get out a particle, certain amount of time, out comes the next one. Certain amount of time, out comes the next one. So this is the distribution of time. So like most of the time, there's about that much time between. So these are little delta t's down on this x-axis. Sometimes it's way down here small. They come out really fast. Sometimes they come out really slow up there with, with big delta t's. But most of the time, they're here in the middle, and that's their probability distribution. So particles don't just always come out one every second or something. They, you know, it's a process where you heat up a filament and it boils off electrons or something, and then those electrons are pushed this direct, put out through there by magnets. And there's some statistical process going on here creating the problems, whether it's statistical in boiling electrons off or whether it's statistical in having atoms uh, change quantum states and produce photons, whatever. It's a statistical process. So you end up with a statistical distribution of the time between pulses as you turn this thing down so there's fewer and fewer and fewer particles coming out. The other thing that's going on here is if the particle is light, of course, there is no probability distribution for light in the sense that it's always constant speed. So it would be one of those single value probability. It's always the same speed. But if it's electrons or buckyballs yeah, or anything, and they've done this now, the latest I think it was a year or so ago with a molecule that was much bigger than a buckyball. Yeah, it was 100 and what? Yeah, it was big. It was like 190 atoms or something put together in this big lump that makes buckyballs look little. They're only 60, 60 atoms. And they put those through the slits. It works the same way. It's not just something magic with light. Any particle, any particle will work through this. So you throw electrons, you throw hydrogen atoms, anything else through here. Buckyballs, which is 60 carbon atoms in a, like a soccer ball configuration. You throw them, they work the same way. They distribute themselves in, in uh, diffraction patterns. If you don't look what slip they go through. So it's not a, just a freak thing with light. Okay, so the way it works, let's say you have an electron, then the two patterns that you have is this to say, when is it coming out? What's the time between particles coming out? And this, which would say, what's its velocity? How fast is it moving when it comes out? And if it's a light, it always comes out at C. And that's it. You can, all the physics and all the engineering and everything that's going inside of this particle generator now been reduced to probability distributions. And they're both generated, both, all these particles are generated by random processes. So of uh, decaying atoms and you know decaying electrons decaying down to different levels in uh, in atoms or with electrons boiling off of a filament if you're doing electrons or with buckyballs being whatever generates buckyballs you know it's a it's a random process of how that uh, of how that works okay so we've now got that generator this term down here is a probability of delta t from the particle generator, and the other thing is, a, is an average frequency of particle generation uh, in particles per second. Okay, and particles per second is a frequency. One over the frequency is a time period. That's the delta t. So that's how they're related to each other. Okay, here is that probability distribution for the delta t. And as you can see, there's, what do we have here? I started to read the numbers on the slant. Those are tens. So 10, 10, 20, 20, 30, uh, 20, yeah, 30, and what's the top? 90. And I made this perfectly symmetric because then it would be real easy to me to point at it and say, this is the average. It's the average because it's exactly the same on both sides. 
and that average happens to be here at 33.33 uh, .33 milliseconds. Okay, there's milliseconds down here on this number. Okay, well, if you have this many milliseconds, then one over that's a frequency of about 30 particles per second is going to come out. So this is that distribution for delta Ts. Um, now, I'm just making these numbers up. This doesn't have anything to do with the real world. I'm making them up because they're easy, round numbers for you to see the point of what's going on. Now, this is kind of important for you to understand the particles. Here's the dotted red line. There's the two slits. Now, I just copied those slits and stuck them in here to try to cover the pattern up. I kind of ran over on this side, but I ran under down here. But I got about six of those slits to cover up this amount of area. So each slit then is about one-sixth of the area of the whole red box. Remember, the red box is going to be evenly illuminated. All right? That means that, that the uh, ratio of the area in one slit to the area inside that dotted box is one to six, right? So the area of both slits together is one-third of the whole box. Well, given that that probability of even getting it in a box is 0.8, then if you take the 0.8 times the one-third, you're going to get the probability that a particle will go through either slit. Okay? Now, if you're going to multiply that times the fact you're going to have 30 particles per second, you end up with the 30 times one-third times 0.8, which even I can do. The 30 divided by a third is 10 times 0.8 is 8. How about that? And you end up with, on an average, on an average about 8 particles per second being sent out of this. Now, in the real world, you don't have eight particles per second. You have it scattered all over from that distribution. This is just the average. Okay, because I was clever enough to make this symmetric, and the average is real clear here. So that's just the average that you get. That'll happen more than anything else. All right. So now we have how this thing works. And then we can take a break here and go to the next step after food. Okay.